Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. The Gospels bring us the account of what we commonly refer to as Palm Sunday. And when I say the Gospels, uh, that means at the beginning of the New Testament, your Bible's broken into Old Testament, New Testament, and the New Testament starts off with four writers' accounts of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ when He was here on the earth. Now, that's not the first ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can trace that all the way back to the beginning. It says that everything was created by Him that was created, and nothing that was created wasn't created by Him. And so we see the Lord in creation. But at, but at uh, a certain point in what we call history, <clears throat> He stepped out of that and came to earth and was born as a human being, as a baby, and lived a perfect, sinless life that was culminated by his death on the cross, his substitutionary death, taking our place, dying in our place, having all iniquity laid on him, and dying and descending to the place of punishment for sin. That's hell. And after three days and three nights coming out of there, resurrected from the dead and raised to everlasting life. He's now ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God until he gets the instruction and command, go, and he'll return. Now, (coughs) each of these writers write from their perspective, and, and there's many, many similarities in the Gospels. There's some things that are accounted in all four of the Gospels. Many things aren't. Some things each of them refer to or actually say that Jesus said. Some don't. But Palm Sunday is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we're going to start by just looking real briefly at the book of John. Now why do I say briefly? Because it has the shortest, most succinct description of Palm Sunday, of that day, and as you're finding John chapter 12, I'll just say again that this week I was, I was conversing with a, a professional person here in La Crosse, and he said to me, he asked me the question, what is Palm Sunday? Why is there a Palm Sunday? I understand Easter, Good Friday and Easter, but what is Palm Sunday? Not, not, not you know, a story he heard growing up. Palm Sunday is that day, one week before the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. And he came into Jerusalem that particular week. Now, you may have never really contemplated and asked yourself, why did he come in? I mean, the story that we have, and you you can go ahead and you, you will read it four times this morning. The story that we have, he came in and he told two of his disciples, go find me a ride. Couldn't say, hail me a taxi. He said, there's going to be a foal, and there's going to be a colt with that foal. You're going to find him tied up. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. How do you know that? That's what the Bible said. The Bible is written back in the Old Testament. He inspired it, and it was written down that that's what would take place. So he sent them. They found it. They brought it back, and they put their clothes on, on this colt. And he got on the colt, and he came riding in on that colt. And as he got close to town, and they saw who it was. Now, in John, it tells us, if you read it in context, it tells us that this was very, very shortly after Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And that was still in the minds and in the hearts of those people. And that's part of the message that went forth. The one who raised Lazarus from the dead, he's coming here right now. And people came from everywhere. The Pharisees even said, the whole world's chasing after him. We're not going to be able to retain our power because the whole world's going after him. And he came riding in, and people were so moved, they did what, what we'd call rolled out the red carpet. 
They took their clo cloaks off. They took their coats off, their sweaters off, and they laid them in the way and, 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 and made a path and a trail for him. They, they, they got to where that was done. They started tearing branches off the, off the palm trees and laying those in the path to prepare this way for the king of glory. Uh, took him in. They started shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So loud that it stirred the whole city. Now that's what Palm Sunday is. But listen. Ask yourself the question. Why was he coming to Jerusalem? Why was he coming to Jerusalem? The Passover was in five days. He was coming to die. He was coming because this is where the sacrifice would be made. It would be made at Passover. He would be the Passover lamb. He was not coming here for a ticker tape parade. He wasn't coming here to do a victory lap. He wasn't coming here to be celebrated and applauded like someone who'd just been named MVP of the Super Bowl. He wasn't come for the confetti to float down like somebody who had just won a national election. He wasn't coming for the laud and applaud of the multitudes of people. He was coming to that city to die. And it would be in days, not weeks, not months. He was coming there to die, to be crucified, as was throughout the Old Testament prophesied. It was required that he suffer and that he die and that he descend and pay for sin and then conquer death and come out of that grave. And he told them again and again and again, that's what's going to happen. And they didn't hear it. They didn't hear it. So let's look at, <clears throat> let's look at John's account. Now John's account starts with verse 1 in chapter 12. And Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, had been dead, whom he'd raised from the dead. And they made him a supper, and Martha served, no surprise, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. And this is the account of Mary breaking that alabaster box worth a whole year's wages and pouring it on him. Now, there's, those that stood by, stood by said that that was a waste. But Jesus told them that she has anointed me for my burial. And we see that in other of the Gospels. That's what she did, and that's why she did it. Now take up in verse 12, and it says on the next day. So now it's only five days before the Passover. On the next day, many people were come to the feast. So they were already assembling. They were already coming from everywhere to be there for the Passover. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches off the palm trees and <clears throat> went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found this, this, this donkey, sat therein to fulfill what Zechariah 9 verse 9 said. <clears throat> Those things understood not his disciples at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Now, we'll just stop right there. That's everything that the book of John says about Palm Sunday. Now, you wouldn't think so because previous years and other times in your life, you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there's more of an account in those chapters. But <clears throat> I want you to remember where we are in the book of John. I want you to remember where we are. We're only at the 16th verse of chapter 12, and Palm Sunday is over. It's only five days till Passover, and Jesus came there to be sacrificed. But I'm going to submit this to you this morning. <clears throat> he still had a lot of work to do. He still had a lot of work to do even before his arrest. He had a lot to do. Now let's go back to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19. Just back to the left a few verses, or a few pages, excuse me. Luke chapter 19, and we'll start here 
in, <clears throat> in verse 35. 19, verse 35. And they brought him to Jesus. Now him is the, uh, is the colt. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and set Jesus on. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the, in the path or road or way before him. And when he was come near, now to the descent or bottom of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. What did they begin to do? Rejoice, rejoice and praise God with a loud voice <clears throat> for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said, Master, rebuke your disciples. He answered and said, If I tell them to hold their priest, the stones will begin to sing. And when he was near, he beheld the city. And this is known as his weeping over Jerusalem. You'll see it in other Gospels as well, 41 through 44. And he talks about this city of Jerusalem, how, how that you, the day of your visitation came and you missed it. The day of your, I've, I've watched this happen in human beings' lives. The day of their opportunity came and left. Yeah, I've watched it happen to churches. I've watched it happen to New Testament churches. The day of their visitation come, and they stuck themselves stubbornly in the tradition of their church instead of moving forward and going and growing and continuing on with God, and they die there. The day of their visitation, they missed it. And he's weeping over Jerusalem. In one translation, is, or in one of the Gospels, it says, as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, so I wanted to gather you together, but you would not come. He talks to him about the Roman persecution that's going to come in the year 70 A.D., and it came just exactly like he said it was going to there in verse 43 and 44. Then, verse 45, he went into the temple and threw out those that sold and bought therein and said, it is written... That my house, whose house? house? My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple. I want you to, we're going to read the next two verses. And I want you to notice what it says in these two verses. Now remember, what day is this? What day is this? This is five days till Passover. He's been on the earth for 33 and a half years. He's been in the ministry, as we would say, for three and a half years. And for the next three days, he does some of the most powerful teaching that he's done in his whole life and his whole ministry. And this is what it says in 47, 48. And he taught daily in the temple. And the chief priests and scribes and chief of the people sought to destroy him and could find no way they might do it, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now, if you think about and if you look through the teaching of this book of Luke, what do these next three days include for us in his teaching? Look at chapter 20. Look at chapter 21. Look at chapter 22. Now, now, think about where we were in John. Where did we stop in John? 12. And we actually started in, stopped in 12 and, and verse 16. Think about what he taught in those next three days. The rest of John chapter 12. All of chapter 13. What's in 13? Uh, the example of being a servant wrapping the cloak or, or the towel around his waist and bringing the water in. How about this one? How about this one? A new commandment I give you that you shall love one another. How about this one? And greater things than I shall you do because I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And then all of chapter 14. What do we learn in 14? That I'll send you another comforter and he'll be with you forever. And then chapter 15, more revelation of the Holy Spirit. And then chapter 16, and he'll guide you into all truth. Read your Bible at some time, some point, thinking about, look at all the teaching in John 12, John 13, John 14, John 15, and John 16 that Jesus did after coming to Jerusalem to die. 
And all of that truth that we have and enjoy and embrace and grow through and live on, all of that is after Palm Sunday and before his arrest. All of that. And then there's John chapter 17. Remember what John chapter 17 is? The Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17 is the prayer that Jesus prayed. Not a type, not an instruction on prayer, not a pray after this manner and giving you steps. No, this is the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 17. Well, what verses? The whole chapter. It's all words of read, and it's everything Jesus prayed. He did that after Palm Sunday and before his arrest. Now turn back to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, we look into this gospel, Matthew 21, and we'll, we'll start off, uh, we have the account in verses 1 through, one through uh, 3, again, of them finding uh, the colt for him to ride in on, and then verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. That's in Isaiah 62. And then you have verse 5, and it quotes that verse. And then verse 6, and the disciples went and did. Wow, what a powerful verse. They went and did as Jesus commanded, and, and, and they, they brought the donkey and the colt, put their clothes on it. The great multitudes spread their garments in the way, cut down branches in the trees, strewed them in the path, and multitudes before and that followed after, cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And they said, Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And now it goes on, and it talks about what happens when he actually goes into town. And it says, He went to the temple of God. And he cast all of them out that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that, threw, that, 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 that sold doves. Now this is the second time he did this. Remember that? Remember the first time the disciples looked at him and they remembered that verse. The zeal of God's house has consumed him. I mean, he took God's house seriously. He had a zeal about it, and when things weren't being done right there, and, 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 and things were being done wrong there, uh, he went in and cleaned the place up. That's exactly what he did. One of the Gospels says he sat down and braided a whip and walked in. Oh, I'm still looking for the artist rendition of, of, of his, his foot up in the air like that, kicking one of those tables, money flying everywhere, that whip snapping through the air. Gentle Jesus. Oh yeah, he overthrew the tables of the money changers. He cast them out. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did and the children crying, Hosanna, the son of David. They were very displeased. How could anybody be mad about miracles taking place in the church and people praising the Lord? I submit this to you, that there's nothing wrong with miracles taking place in the church house, and there's nothing wrong with people praising the Lord in the house of God. There's something wrong with the people who criticize that. Yeah. And he said, and they said to him, verse 16, don't you hear what they say? And he said, uh, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? You've perfected praise. Now, it goes on in, in, in 17 and all the way down through verse 22. And we have that great teaching on faith that <clears throat> follows his cursing of the fig tree. We'll read it again in the last of the four Gospels that we'll look at this morning, and that's the book of Mark. But before we do that, I want you to look at then all of the teaching that Jesus does over the next three days. Look in the book of Matthew at the rest of chapter 21. He begins by talking about his authority. And then the parable of the sons, the parable of the, the, uh, the, hu the wicked husbandmen. Chapter 22, uh, the marriage feast, God and Caesar, the greatest commandment of all. Chapter 
23 and all of that great teaching and, and, and that he does there, the tithe being part of that. He laments over Jerusalem in the final three verses. And then chapter 24. What is chapter 24? It's the greatest chapter on what's coming in the end that we have in the entire Bible. And how about chapter 25? The parable of the virgins, the parable of the ten talents, the judgment of all the nations. He does all of that teaching. Matthew chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 24, chapter 25. That's what he comes to Jerusalem to do. His teaching ministry isn't finished yet. And after he rides in, and he's coming there to be the sacrificial lamb of God, and he finishes out his teaching ministry there with some of the most powerful, powerful truths and instructions, verses that we have in the entire New Testament. That's what he does following his triumphal entry. Now, Let's just look at a couple things and just make note of them before we leave Matthew. Let's look at, look at verse 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. And it quotes the verse, and verse 4 says, All of this was done so that the Scriptures would be fulfilled. You know, there's not one prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ that wasn't fulfilled. Not even one. There wasn't one single verse that was prophesied throughout the entire 4,000 years of Old Testament history. Not one verse that was spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ that was not fulfilled. Every single one. The God that you serve watches over His Word to perform it. Jeremiah 1.12 says, I watch over my word to perform it. And Mark 16, verse 20 says, He confirms His word with signs following. If God said it, He'll do it. You can base your whole life on it. You can have great confidence in it. If the word of God states it, if the word of God says it, it is going to come to pass and God will see to it. And then, and then, verse 6. See, he gave them instruction, and he said in verse 2, Go. Go and find this colt and untie it and bring it to me. And it says in verse 6, what a simple verse. What a simple verse in the Bible that you and I can absolutely do. And it says, and the disciples went and did. They did what? They went and did as Jesus commanded them. They didn't think about it. They didn't pray about it. They didn't fast to see if it might be the Lord's will. No, when the Bible said, assemble yourselves together, they just went and did it. When the Bible says, forgive everybody of everything, they just went and did it. When the Bible says, don't judge others, then they just went and didn't do it. Yeah, when the Bible says, bring all your tithe, they just did it. When the Bible says, go into all your world and share the gospel, they just did it. When the Bible says, stop lying and tell the truth all the time, then they just did it. When the Bible says, love your wife as Christ loved the church, they just did it. When the Bible says, bring your kids up in the nurture and admin, they just did it. When the Bible says, don't critique anyone else, they just didn't do it. Yeah, and the disciples, they just went and did. They just went and did. And there's a whole Bible verse dedicated just to the fact that they were obedient. They were obedient to do what the Lord told them to do. Praise the Lord. You ought to just have your hand raised up right now saying, that's me, me too, praise the Lord. I just, I just see it and, and I just do it. All right, now let's wrap up by going over to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 11. And this is Mark's account uh, of, this, of this very same principle, excuse me, of this very same uh, arrival in Jerusalem. Uh, and some of the same principles are here. Uh, Mark chapter 11, we'll just start reading in verse 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus. Remember, they went and did. He brought the colt to, to Jesus, and they cast their garments on him, and he sat on him. And, and, and many, many spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches off the trees and strewed them. And they went, and they followed, and they cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. Entered Jerusalem and in the temple, and when he looked around, Jesus entered the temple and looked around. That's all the Bible says he did. Jesus entered the temple and looked around. Always reminds me of Revelation chapter 3 when the Bible says he walks in the midst of his churches, searching the reins of people's hearts. 
The Lord Jesus comes to church through the person of his Holy Spirit. Now, and he just makes observations. He observes sincerity. He observes insincerity. He, he observes motives. That's the reins of, of a person's heart. Ambitions. He, he, he observes pride. And he observes humility. He observes selfishness. And he observes stinginess. He observes love. And he observes hate. He observes hope. He observes faith. He observes unrest. And he observes peace. He observes strife. And he observes unity. He observes people who worship him with lip service. And he observes people who worship him right from their heart. It's what Jesus observes when he goes to church. That's what he does. He went into the temple and he looked around. Didn't do anything, just looked around. Came back later and kicked over the tables of the money. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, that's verse 11. Yeah, jump, jump right over, jump right over to verse 15. And he came to Jerusalem, went into the temple. This is the next day, by the way. This is the next day. Verse 12, on the next day, he came, to, he, he, he came from Bethany, and he went to Jerusalem and went into the temple and began to deal with what he looked at the day before. Yeah. I've always said, Lord Jesus, I don't want any of those day before things. I want to keep it clean. I want to keep it holy. I want to keep it right. I want to keep it unified. I want to keep our worship sincere. I want to keep our heart set on eternity. I want to keep our, 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 our ministry to the world living and vibrant, witnessing to everybody. I want to keep our eyes fixed like a flint on your word. I want to keep you preeminent above all things. I want to keep ourselves broken and submitted and humble and willing servants of yours. Oh, he didn't find that at this church. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple and began to... He didn't go into the farmer's market and do this. He didn't go to the mall and do this. He didn't go to the to to the to the to the big box store and do this. He didn't go to the grocery and do this. Any of those places it would have been just fine. He came to church and had to do this. I said he came to church and he began to cast out those that bought and sold and overthrew the tables, overthrew the tables of the money changers. You do know what that looks like, right? Huh? Yeah, stack of dimes, stack of nickels, stack of pennies, stack of quarters, stack of 50 cent pieces, stack of dollars, stack of fives, stack of ten. And he just went in there and just kicked the whole table over. Kicked the table over. <laughs> Overthrew. Not told him clear, just threw the thing right over. Overthrew the tables and the seats. Kicked the chairs over too of those that sold doves and would not allow anyone to carry any vessel through the temple. There's stuff you need to leave home. Amen. 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 And he taught and said, Is it not written that my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? You've made it a den of thieves. Now, let's talk about this for just a moment. We're in the middle of a series here at Living Words about the local church. It's about the local church. Jesus is talking right here about his house. About his house. The designation that the New Testament gives to the local church. Never gives that designation to the universal church. It gives that designation to the local church. He says, my house. My house. It was right there in Matthew chapter 16 that he said, I will build my church. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, speaking to the first minister's conference. All these ministers pulled together, and he called it the church of God that he's purchased with his own blood. It's not our church. We don't have the right to run it the way we want to. Take a vote and see what's popular and how long it should be and what color it should be and, and, and what the music should be and, 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 and I guess it's 
somebody just got mixed up about it, but I was told this week, this week, uh, I was told of one of our local churches here where they have a committee from the congregation that gives the pastor what to preach every week. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> it's amusing, isn't it? Yeah. When the Bible pattern is Moses walking up on the mountaintop and getting in the presence of God and coming down with the word that God gave him to bring down. Not developing his own sermons and preaching what he wants. Finding out in the closet. I'll give myself to prayer and ministry of the word. Something tells me in that situation, people have forgotten who he works for. And he's probably forgotten it too. Now, this isn't our house. People write me sweet notes and cards and say, I just so love your church. Not my church. Amen. It's not my church. I didn't purchase it with my own blood. Acts 20, 28, it's the church of God that he has purchased with his own blood. There's only one head of the church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he ought to tell us what should happen there and what shouldn't happen there. And, and we should make absolutely sure to the greatest and best of our ability that the things that... that he doesn't want in there, doesn't take a personal visit from him Amen. to deal with. Yeah. Now, he loves the church so much, that's what he does. Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, there are seven churches, and he writes a letter to all seven of them. And they are some of the most scathing rebukes of anywhere in the Bible. And they're all to churches because they had things out of line and out of order. Just like the temple at Jerusalem there when he says, <clears throat> my house is supposed to be one way, but you've made it another way. Now, what did he say? He said it in other gospels as well. What did he say should be the primary purpose of his house? Stop and think about it. Stop and think real hard. He said the primary purpose that my house exists is prayer. But tell me how you define prayer. What's, what's prayer? Well, that's when I tell God what I want. No, that's not what prayer is. That's not what prayer is at all. Prayer is not you telling God what you want. Prayer is not describing your problems to God. Read Matthew chapter 6. God already knows your problems. That's not what prayer is. The simplest definition you'll ever find for prayer, the simplest to understand, the best one I've ever found, and it's easiest to communicate, is that prayer is communication with God. Amen. That's all prayer is. It's communication with God. Now, when I say that word communication, com say it with me. Communication. communication. Look at the base and root word of communication. What is it? Commune. Commune. Prayer is communing with God. See, when we have a conversation, you call me on, the, on the, the office phone, I call you on the cell phone, I talk and you listen, right? No. You talk and I listen. And then I talk and you listen. And then you talk and I listen. And then I talk and you listen. We're communing. We're communicating. And that's what prayer is. My house shall be called a house where people commune with God, where they hear from God yes, yes. through a mouthpiece. Who's got your cell phone? Better not be on. <clears throat> okay, right, is it on? Oh, it's on! Okay, where's the mouthpiece? Right about here? Where's the mouthpiece on this phone? Right here? That's the mouthpiece. Where's the speaker? Right here. Go ahead and exalt the office of pastor. That's all I am right there. I'm just the link of the communication. God is speaking to you, and you're hearing him through me. That's all I am. That's all I am. I'm speaking on his, it's his message, and you're hearing him through this ministry. Communication with God. You're hearing from God, and then you're articulating to Him. What are you articulating? If prayer is not just telling Him about what you need because He already knows it, what do you say to God while you're here? Well, you praise Him. Yes. This is part of what happens in church. 
You praise him. You rejoice in his goodness and his provision and his promises. You bless him. Amen. So, so far we're up to praise, rejoice, bless. You thank him. That happens in church. Well, I know it happens in other places. That, that's, that's fine. You can hear from God in other places. You can talk to God in other places. But this is the primary purpose that the head of the church, the creator of the church, that the head over all, that he gave us. This is what happens in church. You make confession of his word. He said, he's the one that said, put me in remembrance. That's what is supposed to happen in church. I said, that's what should happen in church. All right. What shouldn't happen in church? Well, let's start with right here on top of our list here. That, 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 that's what happened here. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, buying and selling. Should that happen in church? No. That's not what, that's not what this, this place, this place is about communing with God. That's what I said, communing with God. All right. Maybe, maybe this is what should happen at church as the primary purpose. Maybe I should put this up here. How about this one right here? <laughs> Buying and selling, recreate, find a mate. <laughs> you mean that doesn't happen? Just, well, it does sometimes. I mean, it's okay if it does. That's where I found my wife. But it wasn't the primary That's purpose. It. It. it wasn't the only reason that I go. Amen. I don't go to scope everybody out. Amen. It's not why I go. Amen. Now, I've got all sorts of stories and all sorts of testimonies of men who needed to be kicked out, needed to be removed, because they just come to find a good Christian lady that would put up with all of their shenanigans and all of their... Lying and cheating and steal and 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 be a good good Christian wife, you know. Uh, church is not about. <laughs> Showing my stuff. Care how talented and how gifted I am and 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 how wonderful I am at what I do. It's not about showing my stuff. It's not, about, it's not about me. I know church isn't about this. If it is, I've missed it all these years. I was so, I was so shocked at the, the most recent survey. Dr. Barclay actually shared it at his last conference of, the, uh, of the, the, the three biggest reasons people attend church in America today. Now, it used to be because it was geographically close, because it had good parking and a good nursery. <laughs> now, it's because it's geographically close, convenient parking, and I get to have my own way. Those are the number three, the first, those are one, two, three, the criteria for people that choose a church in the United States of America. I get to do what I want. Have it your way. Have it your way. No, that, that, that's down the street. A couple of blocks down that side street over there. Okay. Or, or, there, there's, there's this one. There's this one. To to exert my influence. Well, I'm not coming there. They don't even vote. Those are not reasons that the Bible gives. And, and, and I'm not going to take time and teach on it. I'll just mention 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. 
And that's a verse that's becoming more and more special to us on Wednesday nights because we're teaching through 1 Timothy. Uh, but notice it says, uh, Paul said in the previous verse, I hope to get there soon. I, I hope to get there shortly. But if, I, if it takes me longer, if I tarry long, he said, so that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. So that you may know how to conduct yourself. There are codes of conduct and ways to behave yourself and ways to not in the house of God. Now I've come to my last point. Sad, I know. But face it, there are no Palm Sunday brunches. <laughs> Easter brunches, yes. Here's, here's, here's my last point. And to me, it's always been the saddest commentary on humanity. And the saddest commentary on Christian humanity. The saddest commentary on church people in America, which is my land, my country, my home. And the saddest commentary that I see in these people at this age, in this generation, right here in this city in the Bible. And it's always been something that jumps out of Palm Sunday. This sad commentary on human nature. Mark chapter 11. Go back again and look at verses 9 and 10. Mark chapter 11, verse 9. And they went before him. Now verse 10, they're cutting branches off the trees. They're laying their clothes in the way. He's coming in on this colt. They don't have a clue why he's coming to town. He's entering in and they throw the ticker tape parade, roll out the red carpet and cry with a great loud voice. One of the other. One of the other gospels said that 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 it shook the whole community. Everybody in town heard it. And they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. He that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And it is resonating through that community. And people are coming from everywhere. One of the gospels says that the, the, the Pharisees came running and saying, don't you see what's happening? The whole world is following after him. six days till the Passover. Now five days till the Passover. He's going to be arrested the day before the Passover. Look over at chapter 15. Chapter 15, the book of, book of Mark. And at this point, he's already been to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's already been arrested. He's already spent Spend some time in their incarcerated in, 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 in their hold, and now he's going to be sentenced to die. In verse 6, at the feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whoever they desired. And there was one prisoner named Barabbas who lay bound with them that had made insurrection and committed murder. And the multitude cried aloud, desiring that he should do as he had always done. And Pilate answered and said, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him because of envy. And the chief priests, the chief priests, they moved the people. They influenced the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said to them again, what will you that I should do to him that is called king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? And they cried out even more exceedingly, crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content the people, 
released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. I used to count this as four days. I think my count was a little off. I think it took all of three days. Three days for an entire group of people to go from Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, cutting down branches, throwing their clothes in the, in the road. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel. And four days later, this same group of people, same community of people, the same multitude of people are crying, crucify him. Crucify him. The ungodly king, the ungodly leader, Pilate, asked him a question and says, why? Why? What evil has he done? Not one person knew any evil that he had done. They get caught up just as people do today in the crowd mentality. They don't have a clue. They don't even know what they're doing there. And they're part of the multitude and part of the crowd. And two days ago, they were in church crying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And three days after that, they're out there saying, nail him to the cross. And that's people. That's human beings that are challenged to absolutely just make their decision, their determination, take their stand and saying, I don't care what comes and what doesn't come. I don't care if it becomes unpopular or remains popular. I don't care if it's convenient or it's inconvenient. I am a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, come will or come won't, come what may. I'm going to be a Christian. Not because the people that I'm around at work aren't, or are, not because the people in my family aren't or are, not because some of the people in my church are or aren't, not because it's popular in my community, and you know how, how important it is to be popular. but who will just make a decision, make a determination, and just take their stand and not be one of this multitude and not be one of these kind of people. It wasn't just his disciples and those that followed him. It wasn't 12 people. It was an entire multitude from this community that was crying out, that was to the top of their lungs, that was disturbing the whole town by saying, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And four days later, they're crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I'm going to close giving you seven things. I'm just going to write them up here. I'm just going to write them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That ought to be ought to be shown, demonstrated, and exhibited in the life of every Christian. Number one, stability. 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 Back in Isaiah, it says that, that truth will be the stability of your times. The stability of your times. Number two, consistency. Consistency. Consistent just means you're just the same today as you were yesterday. Yeah. Consistent means you're the same on Monday as you were on Sunday. On. Consistent means you're the same on Wednesday night as you are on Friday night. Yeah. Consistency means you're the same around church people as you are around the neighborhood. Yeah. It's just you're just consistent. Yeah. You're just consistent. Number three, faithfulness. These ought to be displayed. Don't you agree? The, these ought to be displayed in every Christian, everywhere. Faithfulness, I love one of the definitions of faithfulness. It's called predictability. It's Sunday morning. I know where I can find them. I know where I can find them. I'm going to ask them a question. They're going to answer me from the Bible. How do you know what they're going to say? Because they're always that way. They've just always got the Word of God in their mouth. 
Huh? They're, they're, they've always got the joy of the Lord. And they're not up and down, up and down, back and forth, in and out, up and down, in and out, back and forth, back and forth. No, they're not that way. They're consistent. And they're faithful. Number four, what ought to be sh- shown, you, know, you, you ought to show some of this. Demonstrate and exhibit and exhibit maturity, spiritual maturity. Uh, I, I'm going to qualify that. I'm just going to qualify that. Spiritual maturity. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, in the 14th verse, it talks about growing up in Christ. And what it says is that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Well, I used to believe that. Well, yeah, but that was just last Wednesday. Well, I read this article. I got this book. I heard this internet preacher. I went to a meeting. I got a word. And, and, and all of a sudden, they don't believe it, and they do believe it. And he said, he said, grow up. My verse. Yeah, yeah. He said, that you be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine. It's supposed to be windy today. Just watch some things blown around your yard. Watch the leaves and just say, that's not me. That's not me. No, I'm stable, consistent, faithful, and spiritually mature. Now this one, I had to, I had to check the spelling on this one. I had, to check the, I had to get this one right. This ought to be displayed in every Christian's life. Everywhere, everybody, everywhere. stick to itiveness. It's really a word. It really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you start something, like, uh, I got born again. I got baptized in water. Uh, I, 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 Paula, remember? Paula, we were walking when there was a mall. And we were walking in the, in the mall. Remember that? Remember? You remember when there was a mall out here? And we were walking in the mall. We were holding hands. And, and, and we met some people that came to um, Living Word. Right? It was, a, yeah, they used to come to Living Word back in the mid 1980s. And this was like in the early 2000s. And all they come over and say, Oh, great to see you. Great to see you. So, what are you guys doing these days? <laughs> well, we never quit what we were doing. We, 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 we didn't jump ship, we, we, didn't, we didn't fade out. We just stick to it. We just keep we just keep at it. Amen. Have some, have some, demonstrate some stick to itiveness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Uh, number six. Every Christian. Everywhere. Should demonstrate single mindedness. Just single mindedness. If you were praising him three days ago, what happened? What happened? Amen. What happened? Well, uh, somebody backed into my car. What's that got to do with you praising him? I mean, at least you've got something that happened. These people had nothing that happened. These people didn't have anything, did they? They didn't have one thing other than, other than the religious leaders of the day stirred them up to curse the Lord and say, nail him to the cross. They didn't have anything that happened. Pilate, what, what, what evil has he done? And they, and they couldn't even say it. And they couldn't even tell. And they couldn't even tell. And lastly, and lastly, every Christian ought to show some of this. I said every Christian ought to show some of this right here. Right here. Some resolve. Come on. <laughs> just some resolve. You know, resolve just means uh, I'm resolved. Sink or swim. Go under or go over. Popular, unpopular, convenient or inconvenient. I don't care what other people are doing. I don't care who goes with me. I don't care if it's the thing to do. I don't care what the rewards are. I don't care how much it costs me. It can cost me everything. And just every Christian ought to just not be, not be one of those people. Just not be one. Just not be one of those people who one day is praising him and, 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 and just a few days later, I know you wouldn't do that. 
And, 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 and I know those of you who are streaming, Barb, we've been praying for you in your recovery gym as well. Anyone and everyone else that's viewing and streaming and, and, and is still with us this morning, God bless each and every one of you. Not one of us is a Christian. Not one of us is a Christian ought to have that kind of display. I don't care if it's four days, four weeks, four months, four years, four decades, or four lifetimes. Why do we look at, why do we look at this being called Lucifer who may have served a million of our years before suddenly there was this turn and there was this arrogance that came in and now this determination and decision to ascend and, 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 and exalt my throne above the stars of God and be like the Most High. Why the change? Why not just have consistency and stability and spiritual maturity and single-mindedness? See, the Bible says single-mindedness. Let's see, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, help me, help me, James chapter 1, maybe like verse 5, James chapter 1, start with, start with verse 5, come on, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God, He gives all and liberally, upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, look at verse 6, and then 7, and then 8, it says, but let him ask in faith, whoa, 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 see, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be in our lives, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, tossed, you ever watch the sea? Ever watch the ocean? Never sits. It's always just moving. Always just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. I should not be that mature Christian man, believer, that people go to and say, oh, we don't know what mark we're going to meet today. We don't know if he'll be upset and angry and, and, and obnoxious or, or if he'll be peaceful and kind and gentle. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know if he'll be happy or sad. We don't know if he'll be upset and mad. We don't know if he'll be saying, oh, praise the Lord, everybody. Or, or if he'll be saying, oh, this is not worth being a Christian. No, not he that wavers and, 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 and like, like driven, driven with the wind and tossed. Yeah. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. Now you tell me, is it important to be stable, consistent, stick to it, single-minded, and be resolved? And be resolved. And be resolved. And be resolved. Make your mind up. Bow your heads. Make your mind up. Turn the lights down a little bit. Make your mind up. Get rid of this. Make your mind up. This is Palm Sunday, 2022. Make your mind up today. Resolve it in yourself. If you haven't already, do it. If you've never done it, do it for the first time. If you've done it many times, do it again today. Resolve in yourself that you are a Christian. You are blood bought, blood washed, redeemed, a member of God's family. You're a servant of God. Resolve it in yourself that you're a church family, that you're a Bible family, that you're a loving family, that you're a forgiving family, that you're a giving family, that you're a caring family. Resolve within yourself, I am a doer of God's word and not a hearer only. And I do everything that it says. Resolve in yourself that you're an ambassador for Christ and you're a witness wherever you go. Resolve in yourself that no matter what the reward or no matter how much it costs, your life belongs to the one who purchased you and you will never go back. No, those people in, in, in God, he, he brought them out. Did any of you see the Ten Commandments last night? Charlton Heston up there. God brought those people out of Egypt, and you know how long it took them? Three days. Three days into the wilderness, and they were complaining and griping. It wasn't good enough. They were happy before that. The horse and the riders thrown into the sea. They're shouting. They're dancing. They got the tambourines out. Three days later, they're cursing God, cursing Moses, and want to go back because it got hard. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord. 
a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.